Giro today, Henry Giro. He is one of the leading names and most influential names in the world. And uh, we are honored having him. He is here to answer some questions and more, more discussions maybe. Uh, it will be quite flexible uh, conversation. Maybe we can, you know, turn the direction of the conversation into, into what we need. But we are pre uh, prepared questions to ask him. Uh, once again, we are honored and we welcome you. And Eda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see um, everyone here. Um, today, uh, I would like to, firstly, I would like to remind you some points for a better webinar and some pre basic principles. And then um, I've, I'm going to inform you about uh, today's flow. After that, I would like to go on and briefly introduce our host, Dr. Fatma Muzikaja, and our distinguished speaker, Dr. Henry Giroux. First of all, thank you for showing up from different cities, different countries, different institutions. It's, it's amazing to see everyone again. Before we start, um, here are the reminders. Please stay mute. It's important for the speaker and uh, also for the overall uh, experience. Um, feel free to use the chat box to type your questions and comments. We care a lot about them and uh, we send those notes, questions, comments and suggestions to our speakers after the talk. And today there will not be a question and answer part after the talk. So please make sure you type your questions on the chat box or you can just send us an email uh, on our Gmail address. I'm going to put all the details on the chat box later on. Today we will have an interview with Dr. Jiru and uh, it will take no longer than an hour as we planned it. Now, after some reminders, let me introduce our host, Dr. Fatma Muzikaja and our speaker, Dr. Jiru. Uh, dear participants, Dr. Fatma Muzikaj is specialized in curriculum and instruction, and she is currently an associate professor at Ankara University, Turkey, and she has been recently hosting Global Thursday Talks on Education, and uh, an internationally renowned writer and cultural critic, Dr. Henry Giroux is one of the founding theorists of critical pedagogy. As you know, he is best known for his leading work in public pedagogy, cultural studies, youth studies, higher education, media studies, and critical theory. Giroux's writing has won many awards and he has written for a range of public and scholarly sources. He has written more than 65 books, published more than 400 papers, and published hundreds of chapters in others' book, articles in magazines, and more, as we all know. In 2002, he was named as one of the top 50 educational thinkers of the modern period by Rutledge. And uh, Henry Giroux is on the editorial and advisory boards of numerous national and international scholarly journals. And he has served as the editor or co-editor of four scholarly book series. He co-edited a series on education and cultural studies with Paula Freire for a decade. He is on the board of directors for Truthout, and his books have been translated into many languages. And Dr. Henry Giroux's work has appeared in many prominent news media. And um, as we have participants from Turkey as well, as we know and as we have read, uh, we can also read Giroux in Turkish. Now, very shortly, I'm going to show some of his books, and also we would like to congratulate uh, for the new uh, book as well, if you could excuse me for a second. Oh, technology. Okay. And the ones translated into Turkish. Yes. You are in Turkish, Henry. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I, I'm very honored to be in Turkish. <laughs> now I can share, I guess. Here are some of the books in Turkish, translated into Turkish. And uh, we would also like to show Giro's latest book, Race, Politics and Pandemic Pedagogy. 
we are looking forward to. Uh, is this is this what you're working on now, Henry? I just finished it. It's out. Okay. So we have the cover. It'll be out in in uh, February, I believe. Okay. So with that, dear participants, I would like to uh, give the floor to Henry Giroux and thank you. Okay, Henry, welcome again. And uh, we are very happy to have you to, to have this opportunity and the very reason that we are together now are, are you know, based on some of the problems, some of the issues and, and ongoing, ongoing shaping and influences of some, some things in the world, in all over the world. We are in an age of authoritarian populism where capitalist cultures shape the society and individuals' lives hand in hand with neoliberal policies and now the age of the era of COVID-19 crisis. Within this context, how would you define critical pedagogy and, and its function? Oh, 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 oh. Can it, can it shape the new era of thinking? Can it shape the new era of schooling, educating, or, or what kind of influences can critical pedagogy have on schooling, for example? I mean, I, I think that one of the things you have to recognize is that one of the first casualties of authoritarianism in, in all of its forms uh, are the minds that would oppose it. And, it, and it seems to me that what we have to recognize immediately is this is not just a political issue, but also an educational issue. And it means that questions of consciousness and questions of learning, questions of knowledge, questions of power are really quite central to how we understand the times in which we live. Um, you know, John Dewey used to say that you can't have a democracy without basically having informed citizens. And so when we talk about critical pedagogy, in, in, in many ways, we're not talking about old forms of education, which really are linked to both the older culture of positivism into the, the updated versions of neoliberalism and its more ruthless updated versions of neoliberal fascism. But really, it's not a methodology. It's not simply a technique. I mean, we're, we're talking about a political project, I would think, whose purpose is to equip students and others with the knowledge, the skills, the values, and the sense of social responsibility that enables them to be engaged in critical agents. I mean, critical pedagogy keeps us aware of the questions that need to be asked. How do we talk about the relationship between knowledge and power? How do we talk about pedagogy as a directive, productive intervention that is always about the acquisition of agency? How do we talk about pedagogy in ways that in some way defines our visions of the future? How do we talk about pedagogy as an ongoing struggle over relations of power and the preconditions that absolutely have to be present for creating informed and critical citizens who can act on the world? So it, it, it seems to me that when we talk about pedagogy as political, we're talking about it as a moral and political project. We're talking about it as a way of being in the world that not only understands the world, but provides the kind of context and the preconditions for students and others uh, to basically be able to intervene in the world. So we're really talking about not just the relationship between power and agency, we're talking about what it means to understand so that one can actually intervene in the world. So we're talking about a political and civic project. And it seems to me that to understand this as a civic project is to highlight in, in many ways uh, fundamental questions about you know, what is the relationship between democracy and informed citizens? How do you have one without the other? How do you talk about schools as sites of struggle over power, agency, assigned meanings? What does it mean to basically talk about uh, education as not just simply the production of ideas and knowledge, but the institutions that make it possible? How do you talk about power with relation to teachers who clearly should have control over the conditions of their own labor? How do you talk about education outside critical pedagogy, outside of schooling? How do you talk about it in the larger culture, in the manner of Raymond Williams and his notion of permanent education, in the manner of Althusser, in the manner of Gramsci, in the manner of Paulo Freire, people who are in the manner of Stuart Hall, people who are vastly concerned, or Bourdieu, who are vastly concerned 
with the educative nature of critical pedagogy as the educative and fundamental nature and organizing principle of politics itself. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something that you said, I want to emphasize critical pedagogy outside the classroom, outside schooling. Maybe this is, there, there are some areas that we can move, mobilize uh, our students, maybe mobilize thinking uh, outside the school. And I remember you, one of your writings, you, you took uh, your students to, to movies, for example. And then how, how learning happened there. And this, this experience, for example, can be a model for us. And there is art outside the school unfortunately outside the you know left out the school and then this this is uh, really very important and it is it is not only school only classroom but also outside and critical pedagogy functions may well be functioned outside school maybe in these days with the with the pandemic days in isolation days we we may need this this thinking more more than any time okay i mean i, I thank you for the question it's really a, a, a very very important question and I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to answer it i mean one of the things that i've been thinking about for a long time um, is you know how the role of culture functions as a pedagogical force and clearly i am not the first uh, but, I, but, it, but it seems to me, regardless of the origins of the question, again, whether we're going back to Raymond Williams, Gramsci, Walter Sturr, and Bourdieu, I mean, I, I think it's fundamental to recognize two things. One, that you, you have to understand that the pedagogical dimensions of learning are not limited to schools, that the cultural apparatuses, as C. Wright Mills once talked about, are really very powerful educational forces. And I would argue, in some ways, more powerful today than probably schools, particularly when it comes to shaping the perceptions, the identities, the agent, notions of agency, the modes of identification that take place in a society that is uh, utterly committed to questions of commodification, utterly committed to questions of privatization, utterly committed basically to the rise of a new right logic that we see all over the internet that's basically bringing together new uh, elements of a fascist politics. Uh, and, I, and I think that we're not just talking about these cultural apparatuses as modes of entertainment. We're talking about them as modes of education. They, should, they critically shape in fundamental ways who we are, how we relate to others, and how we relate to the larger world. That's one issue. The second issue is these are not just simply sites of domination. They're also sites of struggle. And it seems to me for young people, that's a particularly important issue because unlike my generation, and I was born after the death of Lincoln, uh, this generation is enormously savvy when it comes to these technologies. And I think that what that means is that we as educators have a responsibility to not only educate them to the political dimensions of these apparatuses and what they do and the role they play pedagogically, but we have to teach them to be more than critics. They're not just critics. They've got to be actually cultural producers. They've got to learn how to produce plays. They've got to learn how to produce radio programs. They've got to learn how to produce films. They have some of them, some of them, without underestimating the massive degree of inequality around the accessibility of these technologies, which we can talk about. Because all of this has to be framed within the question of inequality. Who has access, who's privileged, and who doesn't? Inequality is central to fascism, to say the very least to the new fascist politics, because it's really about the logic of disposability, pushing more people out, concentrating wealth and power in the hands of relatively few people. But for those students we can reach, and the students that they can reach, uh, it seems to me that to educate them and to make them realize that where pedagogy really counts for them outside of the parameters of schooling is, in, is on the cultural front. This is a cultural war. I mean, this is a war over dissent, this is a war over civic possibility. This is a war over resistance. And this is also a space where they can organize outside the limits of a screen culture that in a dominant culture wants to isolate and privatize them. They can reach out. They can talk about sharing uh, publications. 
They can talk about uh, organizing direct forms of action. They can talk about what it means to challenge authority in fundamental ways. But most importantly, they can learn how to make power visible and to challenge it. So it seems to me that that pedagogical intervention with respect to that sphere is enormously crucial. Okay, as educators, we, we want to see something concrete here. And as, as a consequence, I can, I can summarize what you are saying here. As educators, we have the power not to be confined, not to be limited with the distance education. What we are offered through distance education, this is the very you know, <laughs> common term these days. And education is limited, restricted to distance education, but we should have our own agenda, our own curriculum out of this distance education thing, this screen culture thing. Okay. Okay, thank you. And our next question is again about children and youth. And you, you have so many ideas, different, very influential ideas on, on how youth and children are being reshaped by, by some neoliberal ideologies and some, some, some different uh, tools. Especially in this pandemic crisis, during this pandemic crisis, do you think this influence of new liberal policies will be more influential or what, what direction can it go on children and, and youth shaping? I mean, look, let, let's, let's make something fundamentally clear about what it means to talk about youth in the neoliberal age. First of all, youth are a long-term investment in a democracy. They're a long-term investment. The fundamental question that any democratic, democratic society has to ask is how do you organize resources in a fundamental way to make sure that students, young people have a future that doesn't imitate the past or the present and provides the conditions for them for a life of fulfillment in which they can have the capacities that they might have to be knowledgeable, to be literate, to be critical agents uh, is, 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 is basically provided for them. Under neoliberalism, youth are a short-term investment which means we don't make long-term investments in, in young people because they're seen now as a liability. And I, and I think that one of the ways in which we're increasingly beginning to see that is to understand a certain kind of dynamic between neoliberalism and what I call the social, the social welfare state. As, as, the, as neoliberalism ascends and the welfare state is diminished, more and more social problems begin to be criminalized. Hence, Young people, particularly young people in schools, become a particularly vicious object of this kind of analysis, meaning that schools increasingly, particularly in the United States, come more and more to resemble prisons. You have police in the schools, you have resources being taken away from the schools, you have schools that in many ways are punishing students with zero tolerance policies, but most importantly, you have the criminalization of social issues. A student will, for instance, a, a doodle on a desk, and all of a sudden the police come in, arrest that student in some fundamental way, and, and all of a sudden the student is put into the criminal justice system. This is particularly true for black and brown students, because this is not just simply about poor white students. This is mostly about uh, the, the logic of racism. In the United States, a few days ago, a film was released in which an eight-year-old student in Florida was handcuffed because he had hit a teacher, an eight-year-old. They put the hand, his hands behind his back. They couldn't put the cuffs on him because his wrists were too small. They then took him to, to the court and they charged him with a felony. And it was only when that video became public that there was a massive up, uproar and, and fundamentally the charges were, were dismissed. But th this case is simply symbolic of something larger. There are three wars being waged against young people. One is the war of commodification. It's a war that says that young people should define themselves simply by the commodities that they buy and the commodities that they advertise. The second war is, that's a soft war. The second war is the hard war. That's the criminal justice war. That's a war in which the forces of repression bear down on young people, particularly 
uh, disproportionately young people of color, poor young people of color. That means that the punishing apparatuses bear down on students almost every day. More students are put in jail, more students are suspended from schools, more students are punished, more students are basically suspended, more students are charged with, with criminal acts. Thirdly, there's a war of surveillance. And the war of surveillance is everywhere. The war of surveillance now under the pandemic uh, crisis that we now face has been expanded. For, I'm sorry, for, fourthly. Fourthly, there's the war of privatization. And the war of privatization is a war that individualizes problems for young people so that they cannot imagine what it means to translate their own problems into larger social considerations. They lose the possibility of translation. That is a direct attack on their self-esteem. That is a direct attack on their sense of agency. And most of all, all of that adds up to a war of depoliticization. These students are being depoliticized. The pandemic intensifies this, no question. I mean, look, in 1977, I wrote a piece on the culture of positivism. Some of you are old enough to remember this, this phase in, 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 uh, in history. When everything was empirically, Guy Sinise is here, he would remember. Everybody, you know, this is, this is a period where everything was empiricized. And people like Kim and I were, have been fighting this for 40, 50 years. It's worse. It's not about empiricism anymore. It's about what Adorno called the instrumentalizing of everything. It's about rationalizing everything down to its lowest common denominator so that pedagogy now becomes a force of enormous oppression that excludes questions of ethics, questions of social responsibility, questions of justice, questions of power, questions of values, and questions of possibility. I mean, this is a very oppressive pedagogy and we should not underestimate it. I think the great failure of the left, in my estimation, particularly in the United States, is its failure to take the question of education seriously as central to the notion of politics itself. To take the question of, for instance, the question of identification. What does it mean for us as educators to be able to talk to people in ways in which people can identify in some fundamental way the nature of their own problems so that they can translate those problems in ways that give them a broader and more critical understanding of what the problems really are so that they don't end up with a form of right-wing populism. They don't end up sort of looking for the strong man. They don't end up believing that the only problems they have are black people or, or undocumented immigrants or women or, 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 or people who have a different uh, sexual orientation. I mean, these are, these are crucial kinds of issues. Okay, Harry. Sorry, Harry. That, was a bit, that was a bit long, but you know, it's okay, an important this, issue. This, this reminds me of the, the social contract. <laughs> we should regain the social contract. We, we not only need to regain the social contract, we need to do three things. One, we need to recognize that we're in a period of fascism that is almost unprecedented because it's not, we're not putting people in concentration camps, except maybe in China, <laughs> you know. But, but what we are doing is we're reinventing elements of a fascism, ultranationalism, militarism, the degradation of the other, dehumanization, the concentration of power in relatively few hands that gets updated into new forms. That has to be recognized. Secondly, it seems to me, I'm concerned about the social contract, but I'm not concerned about the social contract within capitalism. I'm sorry. Capitalism is the enemy for me. I mean, if you can't develop an anti-capitalist understanding of what a new society would look like, a democratic socialist society, the social welfare state simply becomes a way of preventing capitalism from exercising its excesses. And while, look, I have no trouble with liberal reforms in the immediate sense. People are thrown under the bus. People are dying. People who don't have food. People need food stamps. That's fine for me. But that is not the end goal of a radical transformative movement that is going to be able to address this new stage of neoliberal fascism in which we find ourselves. We need a restructuring. We don't need basically Band-Aids. We don't need to look back to the 50s and say, oh, that was great. We had a social compact. And of course, the 1% only owned 30% of the wealth instead of 50 to 60% of the wealth. That doesn't work, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay, now let's, let's uh, come back to critical pedagogy again. I don't want to do downsize the critical pedagogy into geographic borders of course, but 
how do you see critical pedagogy and its expanding its its borders or its its limitless in for example mediterranean region for example <laughs> in middle east for example in in asia um, how, how do you, how do you see its its situation its positioning and its power maybe um, in all over the world is it becoming more international or especially in these areas there, there is more need maybe let, let, let me let me begin with um, a suggestion i think it's a critical mistake to have ever suggested that critical pedagogy was simply the product of one particular region in the world. Critical pedagogy has been going on for a long time in many places. In Latin America, the United States, in England, sociology of education, in Africa, uh, in Malta, with Peter Mayo. I mean, come on. I mean, let's, you know, to, to in any way limit it to a kind of nationalist logic, it, it, it seems to me imitates the worst dimensions of a kind of undemocratic ethos that seems to suggest something about the superiority of the North. You know, that's a colonizing logic. Let's move away from that and let's make it clear that it, it, it seems to me that those agencies that tend to define critical pedagogy in those ways shares a very disrespectful, if not pathological, association with a form of colonization that works to silence the voices of others who in fact are making enormous contributions and have made enormous contributions. And by the way, let me clarify one thing. I am not the father of critical pedagogy. I find that term offensive. I was just one of many people who at a certain particular time in history was dealing with the issue. So I have no idea where that comes from. I do know that Paulo Freire had an enormous influence on my work and the work of others. And I know that Paulo would never have defined himself as the father, no less, never mind the masculine overtones here uh, of, of critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is a political movement that operates in different contexts and takes different forms. And in its most fundamental, stripped down, ideological perspective, it's about empowering people to learn how to govern rather than be governed. It's about taking seriously questions of context, questions of power, questions of knowledge, questions of values, and questions of organized resistance and struggle because we can't talk about critical pedagogy as simply a classroom phenomena. Disregard what I've said for a moment about the larger cultural apparatuses that are pedagogical. What I'm trying to say now is critical pedagogy has to be part of a movement of organized resistance in which educators connect to social movements outside of the schools and connect with each other. This is not about closing a door in a classroom and being inventive about talking to students in ways that make something meaningful, to make it tr critical, to make it transformative. This is, has to be a massive, organized form of resistance that cuts across a wide variety of spheres and institutions. And if it doesn't do that, it will fail. It'll fail. Okay, we, we have been talking in, the, in these events for, for a few weeks now. Uh, organization, organization of power, organization of uh, you know, educators, pedagogues in unions, for example. Right. In all over the world, there are some unions and organization and connecting each other. This is this is what we understand from partly maybe from critical pedagogy, and this is why we are here. Of course, there there are no borders. There is no geography. It is all over the world where where there is a need. There's a need for thinking. There's, there's a need for, for mobilizing, for movements. Of course, the problems are having the same in all over the world. So the being or gathering in, into unions will be in the, same, uh, in the same form. These days, especially these days, we need to, to get together in such unions, in such gatherings and organizations. Okay, so this is this is an international issue as a result. Okay, we. Harry, yeah, we, can, we I, can, I, I, can I just say something about that? I mean, look. Sure. sure. Uh, if, if I may, just build on your insight, not and not my insight. I mean, it seems to me that you know, Bourdieu was right. 
We need an international movement for the protection of education and for the protection of public goods. We need an international movement. I mean, we see some of that already with the Black Lives Movement, with the Palestinian movement, where these young people are sort of coordinating and, and sort of working with each other in ways to share their resources, share their insights, and to share the, possi the pedagogical possibilities for organized resistance. But I, but I think that until unions and other social movements really not only take the question of education more seriously, but take it seriously, not just simply as a national project, but as an international global project, uh, that would be a crucial move forward. And it seems to me that it can be done in multiple ways. It can be done through the production of a, a particular form of newspaper. It can be done through the production of particular cultural apparatuses. It can be done through the sharing of resources. It can be done through acknowledging the particular kinds of forms of oppression under neoliberalism in particular that universities have in common. The attack on governance, the attack on faculty, the privatization of students, the standardization of curricula, uh, and how we can work together to basically share research and work with other social movements to basically organize spaces of resistance both inside and outside of the schools. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, academics have an enormous responsibility here, it seems to me. Many of them, not increasingly less, particularly those who are tenured, are really, really work in very privileged positions. And I think that they have to be very careful about being seduced by power. I think they have to be very uh, uh, careful about not fighting for the rights of people who are not tenured. I think they have to be energized about what it means to translate their work into ways that make it rigorous and acceptable and are able to talk to public audiences. I think they have to, in some way, in a time of a pandemic crisis, speak very clearly to what it means to talk about how pedagogy is changing worldwide under the kind of... Uh, what, what I would call standardizing logic of this pandemic, screen time, online teaching, uh, you know, the, the lack of concern for privacy rights, the invasion of the corporate sector into these online uh, projects. I mean, these are all fundamental issues that academics as public intellectuals should be intervening in. Their voices should be heard right now in conjunction with unions, social movements, youth groups, black groups, uh, uh, groups that are now being part, who are moving, uh, uh, protesting against what I call the rise of the carceral state and the punishing state. Um, these are very important issues. Yes, the, the subject comes to normally and naturally comes to intellectual, the public intellectuals here and academics and academic staff as, as scholars, we are Public intellectuals. You know, some, some, something should be said here because I don't want to sound uh, too Pollyannish. Look, at the same time, one one of the first casualties of, of any authoritarian regime, as as we well know, is is the attack on intellectuals. In Turkey, in Egypt, in the United States, in Turkey, what over five hundred intellectuals have now been either banished or put in prison. The attack on journalism. Who, and, and, and I see journalists as public intellectuals. Uh, the, these attacks speak very fundamentally in a way to the fact that the first attack on the part of a fascist politics, on the part of authoritarian societies, is to eliminate the people who oppose it. And we have to be very conscious of that. And I think that what that means at some fundamental level is as public intellectuals, we have to take risk. You can't do this without taking risk. And you can't do it alone. And you have to provide safe spaces where we can support each other. And we have to find ways to mobilize the resources to be able to fight a machine, a capitalist machine that has so much power and so many resources that the struggle somehow sometimes can lead us into cynicism. But we can't withdraw. This fight has to go on. It's, it's much too important at this time in history. Yes. Henry, there is stress on us. Say that again. There is, there is stress. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's, let's continue with other questions. Maybe Eda, would you like to take the floor? Sure. Um, thank you. I, I, I was really moved by the strong, um, you know, idea that you have just mentioned. As Patti Smith would say, we, we, we should have the power and we have the power. So we should come together maybe. 
uh, I would like to move on with um, a focus on cultural studies and education. Um, Dr. Giro, you have been introducing cultural studies into education. Okay, okay. Call, call me Henry, please. Okay. Uh, so you have been introducing cultural studies into education and uh, education into cultural studies. How should we um, revisit this merging of cultural studies and education, especially you know, under these uh, circumstances? Well, I, I think what's particularly interesting about cultural studies, as many of you already know, and please forgive me for repeating this, cultural studies emerged basically uh, through Raymond Williams and a, and a number of other people who basically worked in, 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 uh, in education. I mean, they, they were working with workers. I mean, trying to figure out how to redefine the question of education because education not only was meaningful in terms of what it might, what it might mean to address their problems and change their lives, outside of a curriculum that basically had nothing to do with their problems of their lives and to make it relevant. I mean, they wanted to connect education to everyday life. Something happened to cultural studies. All of a sudden, cultural studies, particularly, it seemed to me, in, in, more so in the United States and in, and in England, it, it became uh, academicized in a way that seemed to lose its connection with education in general. I mean, if you look at a, a number of texts that came out soon after cultural studies was at its most popular it, it seems to me, moment, they would have words of depth, they would have definitions, words, cultural study words. And I remember talking to Larry Grossberg once after I received the book that he had actually edited with a number of other people in England, and the word pedagogy and education was not in there. And I said, how is this possible? How can a cultural studies produce a book that does not have the word, the, the term pedagogy or education in it? And the one who got it the most was Stuart Hall. And Stuart Hall never, never let it go that they had basically become so theorized in, in, an, in, in a manner of a kind of scientific positivism in some way. And I don't want to, this is not an attack on theory. This is an attack on jog, jogonizing theory. This is an attack on theory that loses its possibility for being vibrant, for being alive, for being able to speak to people. Because I, for one, don't believe in actions that are uninformed. I think theory is crucial to inform what we do at the level of everyday life. But to take and celebrate the notion of everyday life, cultural studies was crucial in that sense. It talked about everything from the way people interacted in stores and shopping malls and schools. It bore down on the problems that they could recognize themselves in and try to re-theorize within a larger framework. And so for me, the task endlessly was to educate these cultural studies people and say, look, I'm not talking about schooling alone. I'm talking about pedagogy being central to politics. I'm talking about questions of consciousness. I'm talking about the struggle over agency. Are you concerned about agency? How could you, how can you do cultural studies and not be concerned about the question of agency? How can you be concerned with cultural studies and not be concerned with the politics of identification? How can you be concerned about cultural studies and not take seriously what it means to be an organic intellectual? I mean, Peter Mayo can tell you this better than I can, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, Gramsci said all politics is about education <laughs> in some fundamental way. I mean, you can't, you don't run away from education. If you run away from education, then basically you end up believing that the only structures of domination that matter are economic structures. And you have absolutely no understanding whatsoever for what Bourdieu once said. He said, Never underestimate the symbolic and pedagogical dimensions of struggle, which have always been forged, we can always be forged as appropriate weapons, it seems to me, to take the question of politics seriously. Uh, and that forms of domination are not only economic, but they're intellectual and, and pedagogical. So it seems to me that understanding would be absolutely crucial to cultural studies. And cultural studies reminds us, look, you know, I, I said something in Theory and Resistance a long time ago that, uh, that I still think has a lot of value. How do you make something meaningful to make it critical, to, to make it transformative? Think about that. Think about what that means for theory. Think about what that means for teaching. Think about what that means for talking to people in a language that uh, doesn't make it appear as if you have Oxford University tattooed on your head. Think about what it means to, in some way, be able to move through multiple languages and narratives. Think about what it means to respect the languages that people have, not because you want to master it so you can control them, but you want to understand it so you can learn something. 
that's different, right? That's very different. I mean, that's the essence of what Paulo Freire talked about. You know, that we're not just teachers, we're learners. And what that means is that we have to be border crossers. We have to move through multiple spaces and spheres, constantly having a sense of what it means to be respectful and to recognize the limits of our own learning. I must tell you, for me, if I had to give you a definition of critical pedagogy that is somewhat abstract, but seems to me to speak to something important, it's not just about what you need to learn, to be informed, to be critical, to be an agent. It's also what you need to unlearn. What you need to unlearn. What is it has this society made of us? White privilege, masculinity, militarism, consumption, privatization. That's a struggle we all have to engage in every day with ourselves and with others. And it's not about shaming people. I think that's bullshit. I don't think it's about shaming anybody. I think it's about saying, hey, look, how did this happen? How do we deal with it pedagogically? How do we turn it into a political issue rather than an issue of essentialism? No, oh, you're privileged because you're this. You're privileged because you're that. Nobody's privileged because they're this or that. They're only privileged politically by what they know and how they act and how they understand the world. That's a privilege. But that's a privilege that has to be learned and struggled for. It's not a privilege that's given to us. And that's where critical pedagogy matters. Okay, uh, Henry, just uh, sorry, Ada. Just to add, uh, we are experiencing this very, very well these days. Uh, how can we separate public health from economy, from politics, from education, from schooling? What did you say public now, health? health science? Public oh, health, yes. Yeah, yes. It's, yes. A, it's, a, it's a matter of public health, you know. We are, oh, we are talking about. And these look, days, health, health sciences, you know, was seen searching. I mean, look, look, at the heart of an educational project that matters is creating the conditions for people to be able to exercise the capacities to not just simply learn how to survive, but to live a good life with dignity in relationship to others. In order for that to happen, you absolutely have to have faith, not just simply in the notion of the social contract, but in the notion of public goods. There are institutions that are so crucial to how we live, to the quality of our lives, that they cannot be turned over to private market interests. I mean, where does neoliberalism begin? It begins with the assumption that the market should be the basis for judging all relationships and defining all relationships. And that it's the organizing governing principle, not just for the economy, but for everything so that everything is measured by the logic of, of, of profit. That's a predatory system. It's a cancer. It's a disease. It's toxic. It, has, it undermines the public good. It undermines the basic institutions that people need as fundamental, fundamental institutions that need to be safeguarded and put in the trust of the public good. Transportation, health, prisons, uh, infrastructure, water, food, housing, these are all institutions that in some way have to be taken on as part of a government responsibility that guarantees access. Nobody should be, oh, nobody should be denied health care because they don't have the money? What? And where did that get us with the pandemic? It, it, it accelerated the pandemic, limit, made clear the failures of the market to solve these problems, and basically has now caused the death of millions of people throughout the world. Capitalism has blood on its hands. Blood. Thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people are suffering. Millions of people are dying. Millions of people are in, 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 in the realm of potentially dying because of the logic of capitalism, because of its failure to address human needs over the accumulation of capital. This is a pathology. And when it runs out of excuses to defend itself, then it moves into the realm of white supremacy. Then it talks about how immigrants are, uh, are, are, are criminal rapists. People from uh, the uh, undocumented immigrants carry diseases. People who are refugees, who are fleeing from the worst uh, kinds of uh, economic and political conditions. We find ways to dehumanize them so we don't have to invest in them. That's what this is really 
you want to talk about fascism, let me tell you, we are in the midst of a fascist politics globally that far exceeds anything we have seen in a long time. And if we can't learn from history, the issue is not that we're going to repeat it, it's that we're going to become complicitous with it. And that's different. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, maybe I can go on with a note of hope as the last question. <laughs> you wrote about higher education, Henry, and neoliberalism in relation with the idea of public intellectual, of a public intellectual. Um, you also, like many of us, personally try to live your life uh, as a public intellectual in an age of, you know, fake news, as you said, white supremacy, toxic masculinity, and uh, big lies dumbing down. We can just move on and, you know, say a lot more. Here is my question. Actually, I have to. Should we be hopeful about a better, you know, climate and medium for public intellectuals work of teaching and research? And uh, how do you think about creating safe and critical digital spaces that can foster hope? I, I, first of all, let me begin with the presupposition that there's no such thing as agency without hope. Uh, if we can't imagine a world beyond the one we live in, it seems to me that we either become cynical or we become, we become complicitous. So let's right off begin with that foundation. Secondly, let's do everything we can not to disnify hope. Hope isn't like, oh, I'm hoping it'll get better and things have to turn out better. Hope is part of a struggle. Hope is something that involves being educated. Hope means that you believe that people uh, can basically come together to make the world a better place, but you have to find out how to do that, and you have to make sure you know what the obstacles are to prevent it, preventing that. I don't believe you can act otherwise unless you can think otherwise. That seems to me fundamental to the politics of hope. But I also want to make it clear that when we talk about hope, we're talking about education, we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about politics, and we're talking about the spaces that make it possible. And how do we create those spaces? How do we bring people together? I mean, those spaces to me are both historical, literally, meaning how do we learn from the past how people have struggled under conditions, not unlike the conditions that we have, are struggling under today. Secondly, what does it mean to realize rather than think about hope? How does hope become a project and a possibility that merges questions of critique with questions of, 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 of educated hope? How do we do that? Finally, it, it, it seems to me that I, I can't imagine living in a time of tyranny, tyranny is, it, 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 given the era in, in which we live, in which those of us who are educators cannot reimagine the spaces in which we work as one of the few spaces left that really offer the opportunity to educate people, to unsettle common sense assumptions to push against the grain, so to speak, in the, in the Benjamin sense, to think the outlandish, to cause trouble. Intellectuals should cause trouble. We should cause trouble. We should unsettle. You know, when I say safe spaces should be safe, they should be safe in that they should allow people to be unsettled. They should be allow people to cause trouble. They should be allow, they should allow people to think critically. Sometimes that's difficult. And because it's difficult doesn't mean you can't, you shouldn't experience it. I don't believe that hope begins with trauma and ends with trauma. I think hope identifies trauma and then goes, gets beyond it. I don't want to see hope collapse the public and the political into the personal. I want to see the personal translate into the political in ways in which hope goes beyond simply not only reinventing our own sense of agency, but reinventing that sense of agency collectively. Yeah, I know I know some people here who who are very good in creating trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of the people watching here today are people who, who are yeah. who are people who create trouble. You know, James Baldwin once said, he said, ignorance combined with power is the worst form of fascism. Yes. And yes. in the broadest possible sense. And I and I think that when I think of creating trouble and taking risk and unsettling and making power accountable, that doesn't just strike me as political, it strikes me as sensual. Yes. There's something about the joy of being with other people who cause trouble. 
There's something about the laughter. There's something about the drinking. There's something about putting our arms around each other. There's something about celebrating our dignity. There's something about not knowing that we're simply right, but that knowing that love matters when it's political. That it matters, that desire is an element of justice. That justice without desire is empty. Politics without love is empty. That what we do is not just simply about wanting to change the world. What we do is about what Marcuse said, is making the world a joyous place. I'm not interested in intellectuals who can't dance. <laughs> you know, I'm, not into, I'm, not into, I'm not interested in radicals who can't have a drink once in a while. I'm not interested in people who aren't playful. I, I'm not, I don't believe in political purity. But at the same time, I believe in politics. That's different. Yes, the combination of it. We, we had this as a society, as a whole country, seven years ago. We were in the streets for this joy. <laughs> Yes. Created, created a big trouble, <laughs> and we are, we are having, still we are having, you know, in, in individual level maybe, in small groups. This is, this is life, I, th I think, right? I mean, and look, this is hope. This is joy. Fat, Fatma, the greatest thing about the social is it brings us together, and that's why they want to destroy all elements of the social. That's why they want to individualize every social problem. Yes. You know, that's why they want to separate us and alienate us. L Leo Lowenthal, writing in the, you know, in, in, with the Frankfurt School in the 1930s and the 40s, he said, you know what the worst element of fascism is? Social atomization. And I'll tell you, I believe that. Once we're separated, once we're individualized, once we're removed and disconnected from humanity, terrible things happen. Terrible things happen. And I think that and, the, one, the good news is that these dictatorships never last too long because they can't sustain themselves ideologically. They always end up simply operating on the side of repression, full blown. Look at a guy like Trump, a buffoon and an authoritarianism. He'll say anything. He's lost all credibility. We, we now operate in a time of a pandemic crisis where capitalism has lost its legitimacy. It's suffering from not simply a political crisis, it's suffering from a, legitimate, a legitimating crisis. Hence, Turkey, Brazil, the United States, these, they, they, they're, not, they're not attempting to legitimate themselves anymore. Now it's full stop oppression. And that actually opens up more spaces for resistance, it seems to me. That's where the logic of possibility begins to bloom. They're not trying to control your minds anymore, just your bodies. Yes. There's this energy here. <laughs> okay. Okay, Henry, that was so good. And we have to finish here, right, Eda? Because our timing is, is perfect. It's one hour now. But I want to leave the last word to you again, Henry. What would you like to say? How would you say goodbye? Or not. I, I, I think the, the only thing I would like to say is that I'm grateful for being in the company of people like the people who are here today. I think that uh, we have to work together. I think that these are dangerous times. I think it's, uh, as my fiance or Ania says, we have to fight the monsters. And we have to fight them collectively. And we have to do it through education and struggle. And we can't despair. Because in the long run, we're going to win. We'll win. It'll just take time. That's all. Bye. Very good. Very good ending. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fatmoja. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for joining. Thank you. Next week, who's next? No one. We, we want a break now, but we will be, you know, going on maybe end of September okay. or yes. October. You deserve, you deserve the break. Thank you very much for Thank doing you. all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Cheers.